Good morning. As the co-founder of the Bipartisan Policy Center and co-chair of the VPC's health program, let me welcome you to today's webcast. Today, we're releasing recommendations to better alignment and integration between Medicare and Medicaid for the more than 12 million people who are eligible for both programs. About 60% of Medicare, Medicaid beneficiaries, also referred to as dual eligible individuals, are age 65 and older, and 40% are under age 65. They are more likely than the average Medicare beneficiary to have physical or cognitive impairment, and they have more chronic conditions. Medicare spending for this vulnerable population is more than double that of their Medicare only counterparts. In 2018, annual Medicare per capita spending for a dual eligible individual was over $18,000, compared to less than $9,000 for Medicare only beneficiaries. While cost is not the driving concern behind these recommendations, we believe that over time, the integration of services will result in lower spending by reducing hospital admissions and readmissions, emergency department visits, and post-acute care. In the short term, however, integration will require significant upfront investment. Congress and the Department of Health and Human Services have taken actions to integrate Medicare and Medicaid. My colleague, Gail Walensky, will speak to those efforts and to the challenges. But progress has been slow for a number of reasons. They include conflicting regulatory requirements and bifurcated state and federal administration of the Medicare and Medicaid programs, lack of resources, technical assistance, and incentives for state action, the varying situations and needs of dual eligible beneficiaries, EPC's recommendations seek to address these challenges by setting up a policy framework that guarantees every Medicare Medicaid beneficiary has access to a fully integrated care option. Recommendations fall into four broad categories. Removing regulatory barriers to full integration of care. Second, providing resources to incentivize state-led integration. Third, creating a federal fallback program to offer integrated care models in states that choose not to integrate care, and fourth, to improve beneficiaries' experience in the delivery of care. I'd like to highlight two of these areas, state incentives to integrate care and improving Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries' experience. First, it is critical to recognize that state Medicaid programs are under extreme stress as a result of COVID-19. They face increases in the number of Medicaid eligible individuals as people lose their jobs and lose access to employer sponsored coverage. States are seeing reductions in state revenue resulting from the economic downturn. At the same time, we must keep in mind that dual eligible individuals are the most vulnerable to this pandemic. We are hearing news reports of significant infection rates and loss of life in our nation's nursing homes. States face significant challenges in keeping this population safe in nursing homes and in keeping them safe at home and in the community. Integration of Medicare and Medicaid, if done well, is an opportunity to improve quality of care and the availability of home and community-based care. Our report recommends providing upfront investments and technical assistance to states to help provide a need, a regulatory framework to move forward, and a guarantee of a share of any savings that result from integration. Second, we must assure that beneficiaries and their families have the information and time needed to understand both the benefits and trade-offs of integrated care models. To address this, we recommend strong collaboration between CMS and the administration on community living to develop model outreach and enrollment programs. In addition, we believe that increased resources are necessary for the state health insurance assistance program, 
but those investments were comfortable recommending a continuation of the existing policy that permits auto enrollment of Medicare Medicaid beneficiaries into integrated care models with the ability to opt out at any time. Let me now recognize Gail Walensky for her initial remarks. Gail? Thank you very much, Senator Daschle. Since the mid 1980s, federal and state policymakers have been working to better integrate care for Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. 1986, the Department of Health and Human Services approved waivers for the San Francisco based Unlock program. In 1997, Congress authorized the program of all inclusive care known uh, for the elderly, known as PACE, building on the unlock model. In 2003, Congress provided a temporary authorization of Medicare Advantage special needs plans. In 2010, Congress directed HHS to create the Medicare and Medicaid Coordination Office. And over the last decade, we've seen the expansion of integration through demonstrations and through, through the use of fully integrated dual special needs plans. In 2018, after 15 years of temporary authorizations, Congress permanently authorized the program known as DSNPs, the special needs programs. As noted by Senator Daschle, integrating these programs is not easy. For this population, Medicare covers most medical services, prescription drugs and supplies, in short-term stays in nursing homes, but only after a hospitalization. Medicaid covers Medicare premiums and cost sharing, some medical services and supplies that Medicare doesn't cover, long-term skilled nursing care, and home and community-based services for those who need ongoing help at home with basic day-to-day -day activities, such as bathing, dressing, and meal preparation. Where states have implemented the Medicaid managed care, Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries can be enrolled in one or more Medicaid managed care plans for different types of services, including medical care, behavioral health, long-term care, or dental services. These carve-outs of benefits limit care integration of financing and services. 23 years, after the first demonstrations, fewer than 10% of dual eligible individuals are enrolled in fully integrated plans. Remember, these are the individuals who are most in need of care. The vast majority of Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries and their families need to navigate two separate programs with different eligibility criteria, different benefits, different participating providers, and different procedures for filing grievances and appeals. In addition to the recommendations already outlined by Senator Daschle, there are two others that I would like to highlight. The first is program alignment. Our report recommends giving broad authority to the Secretary of HHS to align conflicting program requirements as long as the authority does not result in a loss of eligibility access to care, or beneficiary due process rights. CMS needs the authority to align program requirements to make the care seamless to beneficiaries. As part of the financial alignment demonstrations under authority provided by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMS and states were able to work together to develop joint state and federal oversight of care health plans and providers they were able to develop a single enrollment date, enrollment process, marketing, and member materials. However, this cannot be done outside of the demonstrations. It also recommends that Congress direct the secretary to convene stakeholders to develop a common standard in areas such as network adequacy. The second area I'd like to talk about is the requirement to integrate care with federal fallback program. These recommendations outline a regulatory framework for three integration models. States could use one or more of these models to integrate care. They include improved fully integrated dual special needs plans, PACE, 
and a more flexible managed fee-for-service model based on Washington State's program. Finally, the recommendations include an alternative to the existing Medicaid structure to enforce state requirements. Today, failure to comply with a federal requirement jeopardizes state access to all federal Medicaid funds. Instead, these recommendations provide for a federal fallback program, similar to the ACA regulatory structure for private insurance. Under the fallback, the Secretary of HHS would have the authority to contract with plans to offer integrated care in states that choose not to comply. This would be financed through existing federal and state Medicaid dollars, similar to the recruitment mechanism employed in Medicare Part D. While the report provides a framework for a federal fallback program, many questions remain unanswered and the concept will require additional work. I'd now like to recognize Ariel Mir with Arnold Ventures. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming together today. I am Arielle Mir, and I'm the Vice President for our Complex Care Program in the healthcare team at Arnold Ventures. Many of you may be familiar with Arnold Ventures and our approach to philanthropy, but our investments in this space are relatively new. So I thought I'd take just a moment to share a little bit about our mission and why we at AV care deeply about using policy to mend the broken system affecting the vast majority of people who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. AV's health work is motivated by a deep concern about the affordability of healthcare in this country for individuals, for our governments, and for our employers. One focus of our work on the health team is the high prices we pay. You may be familiar with AV's work to lower drug prices and address surprise billing. But we are also drawn to populations and services that represent disproportionate shares of spending and where outcomes are poor. A prime example of that is the fragmented and uncoordinated systems of coverage and care for people that are dually eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. And changing this broken system means changing policy. Policy development, like the report that we're going to discuss today, is one leg of the stool that AV is helping to build as we work toward change. These ideas and frameworks give the Hill and the executive branch a running start on reform. The second leg of that stool is research. AV is an evidence-driven organization and we believe that policy must be informed by high quality data on what works, what doesn't, for whom, and as best can be, as can be determined, what is driving outcomes. The third leg is technical assistance to states. As Senator Daschle mentioned, system reform is hard and we cannot ignore that in this moment, especially with states facing looming budget deficits, it's critically important to support states in the efforts to transform and to learn from those experiences. AV began our complex care strategy investment just over a year ago. And despite the powerful and clear work that many people on this very webinar have done for decades around the dual eligible population, it was rare to see this issue in the headlines. As you all know, since that time, the world has turned upside down. And now the problems that you all have long documented and warned us are overflowing in our news feeds. The latest data is sobering. Dual eligibles are four times as likely to be infected with COVID as Medicare only beneficiaries. And this is a statistic that reflects unacceptable racial and economic health inequities. This report released by BPC today emerges at a critical moment. It reminds us that not only do we need to address the crisis of the hour, we must also address those long-standing system failures impacting people who are dually eligible. Failures that will not be remedied with a, with a COVID vaccine or treatment. We are so grateful to BPC's work on this project and to their partnership 
We so value the clarity and urgency they bring to elevating policy proposals to break through the polarized and lo often logjam legislature. Good pragmatic bipartisan policy is essential. So thank you again to Catherine, to the staff, to the BPC advisors, and to all the panelists for participating today. We so appreciate it. And I'll turn it back over to Catherine. Ariel, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful statement. And we're, we're very deeply grateful to Arnold Venture's support and partnership in this critically important project and, and our report. And we're grateful for your participation, especially today. It's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Catherine Hayes. And I let me so in so doing just uh, once again thank the BPC staff and Catherine and uh, the leadership provided uh, at BPC on this extraordinarily important project. A lot of people went uh, into enormous work and effort to get us to this point. This was not easy. It never is. But Catherine and her team rose at once again to the occasion. And for that, I know I speak for everyone and expressing our gratitude. Catherine? Thank you, Senator Daschle. And I'd also like to thank Gail Walensky. Both of you have been so good in your support of staff work here. And we really do believe that your voices amplify the messages and the work that we're doing here today. And um, again, also thank you to Arnold Ventures. Um, Ariel and Amy have both been wonderful to work with and we've really appreciated their help and their guidance. Um, I wanted to just speak very briefly to the process that we use to come up with these recommendations. For those of you who are not familiar with the Bipartisan Policy Center, we've been working on this project for the last year but BPC's leaders and staff have been engaged in this issue, in the issue of better integrating care for dual eligibles for more than five years. We have worked with a broad range of stakeholders across that time period with state and federal policymakers, with consumers, with provider organizations, with plans, health plans, um, offering both um, health care and long-term services and supports and with other experts. We will be moving forward with this effort in the coming year. We will be looking at better ways to align program requirements in Medicare and Medicaid. For example, um, Medicare and Medicaid have very different network adequacy requirements, and that would be one, one of the issues that we'd really like to dig into. At the same time, we recognize that the federal fallback program is really just a framework, and it needs a lot of work to flesh it out in those areas where states choose not to move forward. In closing, I'd like to thank um, folks on our staff, Lisa Harutunian, Eleni Salyers, and Kevin Wu for the long hours that they put into this project and their patience. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Sheila Burke, who is a senior fellow at BPC and will be moderating our panel. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and let me begin, as Catherine did, with a series of thank yous. One, thanks to, to Arnold for their continuing support in this area, as in many others, uh, which is critical to our work. Uh, and their commitment to these issues, the issues around drug pricing and others, uh, have really made an enormous difference. Uh, my thanks as well to the staff uh, led by Catherine, who have, in fact, put in extraordinary numbers of hours uh, in looking at this issue and uh, combining uh, from a variety of sources information that allowed us as a team uh, essentially to assist in evaluating how things have progressed and where we need to make additional investments. Uh, and of course, uh, my continued thanks to Senator Daschle, uh, one for having begun uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center, which has contributed in so many ways to many of the issues uh, that confront us in terms of health care. Uh, I hope that we have achieved the result that he and Senator Baker and Senator Dole and Senator Mitchell had in mind when they created the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, in really finding a balance among issues and among positions to come up with reasonable solutions that can be considered. And I think, in fact, they have done that over time. Uh, I am, uh, as Catherine suggested, going to uh, lead a conversation among a group of experts who have been assistance to us. During the course of our work, as Catherine pointed out, uh, we've had a number of people assist us in a variety of ways in participation in 
uh, roundtable discussions, in reviewing materials, in providing evidence based on their own experience in terms of what has occurred. Uh, as we have uh, provided, I think, evidence in the report, there were a great many interested parties, uh, not surprisingly in this issue, which has been with us for a very long period of time. Uh, it is a complicated uh, set of questions, uh, therefore the results, and I think the recommendations reflect those complications. Uh, it is a set of relationships that are enormously important in achieving uh, our goal in terms of integration. Um, and we hope, of course, to better serve the population, the 12 million uh, that are essentially at risk and dependent upon the combination of the Medicare and Medicaid programs to assist them. Uh, they, of course, were at the top of our list in terms of how we focused our efforts and focused our recommendations. But so were the participants in this program, specifically the federal government and the state government, uh, who are critical to really making these programs work uh, and finding a way to work with one another. Uh, it's been described that if you've seen one Medicaid program, you have in fact seen one Medicaid program. And so the added complexity of managing a federal relationship with essentially a variety of challenges on the Medicaid side uh, have made the result uh, a complicated one and made the challenge, uh, not surprisingly, an enormous one. Um, we have four individuals with us today who have essentially uh, contributed to our deliberations, who have participated in those uh, working group discussions and reviewing materials and recommendations, and have provided extraordinarily thoughtful commentary throughout our uh, our work over a period of time with our uh, leaders in terms of the policy group at BPC, along with the staff. Uh, Jean Achaeus, Tom Inglehart, and Jack Rollins, and Louise Simon um, are going to be with us. I'd like to give a brief introduction of each of them. Uh, we'll then engage in a conversation. I'll ask them some questions, and then hopefully uh, they'll talk with one another as well. Uh, in terms of how we came to the resolutions we came to. Uh, and then we will leave ample time for discussions from each of you. So if you are on Google or whatever system you're on, please feel free to contribute questions uh, that I will uh, pose to the discussion group uh, and have them uh, give us an opportunity to hear from them on those questions. Uh, I'm gonna begin with uh, an introduction of Gina Kayas. Jean is the Senior Vice President at AARP, their thought leadership. Um, he has a variety of board and advisory experiences, including the Justice and Aging, the American Society on Aging, been involved in leadership in Maryland, uh, the Editorial Advisory Committee for Generations, which is the journal for American Society on Aging. Uh, Jean has extraordinary experience and has added much to our conversation, particularly focused on the recipients, on people that benefit from these programs uh, and essentially are challenged if in fact we can't find a better way uh, to coordinate them going forward. Uh, Tim Inglehart. Tim has been a participant for um, a long period of time with us in our many deliberations with respect to Medicare and Medicaid. He is the director of the CMS Medicare and Medicaid Coordination Office, uh, which was established under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Tim has a remarkable range of experience in looking at these questions and looking at questions of implementation and the challenges of implementation and coordination and has a firsthand experience as to the demonstrations, what's worked and what hasn't worked. Uh, so we'll depend and have depended on Tim to assist us in thinking about this from this pers the perspective of the federal government. Jack Rollins uh, is with us as well, who is the program director for federal policy for the National Association of Medicaid Directors. Uh, again, an enormously important participant in this process in helping us understand how the Medicaid programs work, one of the things I'll want Jack to talk about is that if you've seen one, you've seen one, and that is the enormous variation among the programs and the barriers they face uh, and the unique set of challenges each of them confronts in trying to stand up any kind of integration. So we'll count on uh, Jack to help us think about that. And then finally, uh, Lois Simon. Lois is the Executive Vice President of Senior Link. Uh, Lois has a long history of being involved in uh, senior projects and national caregiving uh, for the elderly. She was the co-founder and former president of the Commonwealth Care Alliance uh, and has a great deal of experience, particularly with respect to Massachusetts and other areas 
uh, with respect to how one sets up programs to service this unique population. Uh, so again, all four of them have a great deal of knowledge and experience, uh, and each of them has a different perspective that will help us focus on these issues. I'm going to begin with Jean. Uh, and uh, Jean has thought about the consumer focus. And one of the challenges that Gail pointed out was the very low rate of uh, engagement on the part of the duels. Uh, 12 million duels, a very small percentage of them participate in these fully integrated plans. And one of the questions is what is the information that is needed for individuals to make these decisions, to essentially choose how best to identify and participate in a plan? Uh, in many cases, we're dealing with a population uh, that are elderly, that are infirm, that have limited access to this information. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, Jean could talk with us about what kind of education, uh, what kinds of engagement activities uh, would assist in essentially increasing the number of people participating in these programs where they're available. Jean, over to you. Well, first and of all, and I've, I should say, I apologize. I've asked each of our speakers to give just a couple of minutes uh, at the outset about their impressions of what's most important in the report. Uh, and so I'll, I'll ask Jean to do that as well as to engage us on, a, on that first question. Jean? Well, Sheila, first of all, thank you so much. And I also want to start off by thanking uh, the Bipartisan uh, Center for just an amazing uh, report and just the continued leadership to find solutions in order for us to really move in a direction that will benefit uh, millions of uh, consumers, in this case, uh, the 12.2 million uh, beneficiaries who are dually eligible. I'd like to kind of pick up where Ariel left off because I thought that was such a very powerful uh, uh, statement uh, and some thoughts, particularly around policy and the importance of driving policy to change systems in order to impact lives. I think it's critically important uh, given the fact that duels are a high need, high cost population. Uh, and we've heard about their demographic profiles in the course of our conversation today. Uh, that it's fair to say that uh, of the 12.2 million duels, uh, it's fair to say that all of them, uh, similar to all of us that's on this webinar and those who are actually uh, participating in this conversation have some things in common. And what that is, is the fact that we really wanna live a life of dignity, of purpose and independence. Uh, that we really wanna live a life where we are uh, in the driver's seat uh, and we're empowered to make informed decisions. And I think it's fair to say that is something, a key principle and key attribute, particularly for- I'm, a, a I'm on a conference call, I'll call you when done. The, pop, the, the population. Uh, with that, I think it's very critically important, and as we've outlined in the bipartisan uh, report uh, today, the central focus is really thinking about how best to support, empower, and equip the duly eligible population and their family members as appropriate uh, in helping to navigate some of the system challenges that has long existed even pre-COVID. I think it's fair to say, as you even heard from one of the data points that COVID-19 has exacerbated many of the system failures that has long existed. And now we have an opportunity as a country to really think about what are those meaningful and innovative solutions to really start to address this keeping in mind that the duels and their families should be at the center uh, of those transformations. Uh, in light of your question with respects to uh, education and outreach, uh, Sheila, I think it's critically important, uh, particularly in an environment where there's passive enrollment, that consumers have enough uh, information to make informed decisions, especially as their needs change over time. I wanna give Tim and his team a, a tremendous amount of uh, credit uh, for the work that they've been doing over the years to really take into account what are some of the lessons we're learning from those dem uh, the demonstration projects and how do we take those lessons uh, and really start to do the program improvements that is needed. And what we've learned is the fact that, relatively speaking, that uh, consumers uh, who have participated in the demos are generally satisfied, uh, but uh, there are opportunities to continue to improve, uh, whether that is informing them of um, their choices, whether it is ensuring that they understand the trade-offs, uh, whether it is ensuring that they understand the provider network, particularly as needs might change, is gonna be critically important. Uh, over the course of the demonstrations, we've seen uh, tremendous opportunities where uh, integration has yielded some promising uh, results, uh, both in terms of ensuring that consumers are not as confused in terms of nav navigating their care, 
uh, that they are empowered in some very meaningful ways. Uh, but we also have learned that sometimes too much information might be overwhelming uh, uh, and that if we're not providing clear uh, information, communicating uh, information to those who most likely need it, uh, then uh, we still have some opportunities uh, ahead of us. One of the things that I thought was very uh, insightful uh, from uh, some of the focus groups that were done, particularly with the dual demonstrations. Uh, when you heard from some of the beneficiaries was the fact that uh, they all, in many cases, talked about the need to get clear, uh, concise uh, information that would really benefit them in making informed decisions. So really thinking about what are those uh, consumer tools that can help people make informed decisions is gonna be critically important. Uh, the other aspect of this too is understanding uh, the need to provide uh, multilingual uh, information. Uh, and a lot of states are doing that. I think one of the challenges is the fact that some duels may not even know that they can ask for that information in a different language. So how do we start to do that? Uh, so those are some of the things that we can talk about, but I did want to emphasize that we are at a, a inflection point uh, and that uh, this inflection point allows us to really think about what are the systems we need to uh, have in place to really accelerate and ensure that it's very consumer centric and consumer driven. Uh, and that is something that I think we can all agree uh, that we want for ourselves, as well as when you talk to duels, that's something that they are looking for. Thanks so much, Jean. Uh, one of the things I'd like to come back to when we've all sort of had a first round um, is to talk with you a little bit about um, the language issue that you mentioned and how one gets information made available, and also the extent to which the state health insurance assistance programs play a role and whether they can be part of the solution in terms of providing the information. So I'd like to come back to that in a moment if we could. Uh, but I wanna to turn to Tim next, if I might. Uh, Tim, one for some opening comments. Uh, and then uh, I do want, um, if possible, I mean noted uh, by Jean, were the questions about the successes and what we've learned from the demonstrations uh, and what you think uh, is most important. But also I'd like Tim, uh, during the course of our conversation this morning, uh, to ask you to sort of reflect on what the implications are and the challenges that the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic has really presented to what is already, I mean, as Gail pointed out, as others pointed out, an extraordinary impact on this population. Uh, but Tim, let me turn it over to you for some initial comments and then uh, let's talk a little bit about what we know successes and failures in the demos. I know much of the work on this report predated the pandemic, but it's still instructive to start there. Echoing what Ariel said earlier, dually eligible beneficiaries are four times more likely to have a confirmed case of COVID, also four times more likely to be hospitalized with a case of COVID-19. And, um, and there are multiple steps we need to take to control that, right? begins with reducing transmission and work around infection control, especially in nursing facilities and dialysis clinics, work around testing um, and eventual vaccination are big parts of that. But there are other important aspects too, many of which resonate from the BPC report. One would be ensuring access to treatment. That means access to COVID treatment if needed, but also means ensuring access to home and community-based supports that help someone stay independent in their own homes instead of in a nursing facility. And so much of, of integrated care work is about promoting that access as states and CMS have done remarkable work to try to preserve that access in this particular time of crisis. And then, and then the COVID has exposed the, how important it is for us to reduce comorbidities that we know to be associated with poorer outcomes. Highlighted in the pandemic, but this is longstanding disparities work that, um, that you know, has, has to be a point of focus for this agency and for our state partners, frankly, long after we have an effective vaccine for the coronavirus. Underlying disparities in diabetes and hypertension, disparities in access to preventive services and others are in many ways kind of a defining challenge for us for, for many years to come. And I think highlighting the ways in which integrated care can help address those challenges is, is an important part of this report. So Tim, um, if you reflect for just a moment, um, it, it, enormously important points, particularly as we look forward in terms of the continuing challenges 
uh, and unique challenges this population face. But from your sense of the demonstrations to date, I mean, uh, Jean's raised a number of issues and concerns regarding the ability of ind individuals to make decisions, the information that they're provided. Um, have we found particular elements of success, uh, things that we ought to be sure are part of whatever it is we do going forward based on those demonstrations? Yeah, I think we have. I mean, the most important success to date is for beneficiaries and their families. So um, as Jean mentioned, beneficiaries are reporting very high levels of satisfaction with their health plan, with their overall health care and these different demonstration approaches. Um, published analysis on those models has found significant reductions in hospitalizations and skilled nursing facility admissions, even in the very early years of the different demonstration programs. And our own analysis of HEDIS measures shows really remarkable improvement over time. So that's number one. But the second important success is, is structural, right? Um, it, was, it was well and, and, and accurately stated that a relatively small, around 10% of duly eligible beneficiaries in any kind of integrated care. But that's, a, that's about a million people now, and about half of that are in the current um, demonstration programs under the financial alignment initiative. And getting there required the development of a lot of new capacity. So compared to a decade ago, there's vastly more ca capacity and expertise among our state Medicaid agencies. Um, we in the states had much better mechanisms for listening to the people that we serve. Um, and CMS itself has kind of normalized some things that felt a little bit radical um, five or 10 years ago. We also have a new and expanding crew of innovators out there. You'll hear from Lois Simon and her experience soon, but um, Inland Empire Health Plan and Community Health Group in California, uh, Upper Peninsula Health Plan in Michigan, Neighborhood Health Plan in Rhode Island. You can add all of these relatively newly to the ranks of the highest performing organizations in serving duly eligible beneficiaries, right up there with the early adopters in Massachusetts and Minnesota and Wisconsin and elsewhere. So uh, to me, a lot of the capacity development work will, um, will benefit the people we serve for a long time, after, even after a particular demonstration period is up. I think Jean references really well, though, that um, we can and need to do better at communicating with beneficiaries. And I think that starts with information about their options but it also extends to engagement in uh, the healthcare system writ large. You know, lots of us um, approach care coordination and managed care in a kind of naive sense that if we just like offer this additional support, people will take it. And in fact, engagement with, with beneficiaries is something that you have to earn. You don't just give it. And that takes time and skill and effort by the thousands of people on the front lines of of care coordination through these endeavors. Thanks, Tim. Um, I do want to come back when we have a moment um, and talk about networks um, and some of the challenges of establishing those networks. We've had some experience under the ACA in terms of the network requirements. Um, there are particular challenges. I mean, you think about behavioral health and other elements that um, historically, we've not been as good at in terms of determining the adequacy of the networks and how we think about that. Uh, so I'd like to uh, come back to that in a moment uh, once we've uh, again gone through. Uh, Jack Rollins. Um, Jack, some opening comments, and um, I'm particularly uh, interested in having Jack talk about some of the unique differences between states uh, and some of the challenges that uh, individual state Medicaid departments have in participating. Uh, and again, um, once we've gone through this round, I'm also interested in having each of our panelists feel free to engage on any of these issues, because I know Tim has some thoughts as well about uh, the, the difficulties or the challenges of diff different Medicaid agencies and uh, dealing with their capacity. So Jack, let me turn it over to you for some opening comments and some thoughts on the so unique nature of each state Medicaid agency. Great. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you to the Bipartisan Policy Center for, for us an excellent report that so neatly encapsulates a variety of issues that we've been talking about for, for years, and for the opportunity to, to share some of the state perspectives on these issues. Um, and AMD has been working on duals integration for, for a number of years and something that our many of our members have prioritized. Um, 
So as I noted, the, the policy recommendations in this report capture a variety of issues across really the full spectrum of integration work. Uh, but I think one of the most valuable things here and something that Gina's done such a good job articulating already, so I don't want to belabor the, the points that he's already made, is the, the focus on the individual as uh, kind of the locus of decision making and where we're focusing our efforts here. Uh, I think it's a principle that, that we all agree on. As we consider the various systems level changes that need to happen to promote widespread integration, it's going to be critical uh, to continually bring those changes back down to the person level and understand their impacts on the individuals that are being served so that we're not engaging in an exercise to make things more administratively simple for states and the federal government and neglecting the, the actual impacts on, on actual members of these programs. That said, even with this framework in place, uh, integration is very detailed and slow going work. And in the world of state Medicaid programs and the public servants that administer those programs, the experience of integration both to date and going forward is going to be very, very different from state to state. Um, it's a little, I know it's cliche to say this and Sheila's already said it in her opening remarks, but it's very much true that when you see one Medicaid agency or one Medicaid program, you have only seen one program. And I think that's doubly the case when we're talking about the dually eligible population. And as we've already heard, and as the report has plenty of evidence to, to support, duals are not a monolithic population. Uh, they may they they arrive at the status of beca of dually eligible beneficiary through a variety of pathways. And so um, all some of the shorthand that policymakers may have employed to date about thinking about duals is not necessarily giving us the most accurate picture. So it's duals aren't aren't only individuals who age into Medicare and, retain, and are low income. There are many who arrive through the pathway of disability and are under 65. And those needs are going to look different from duals that, uh, that, are, that, have, that are aged and have more physical impairments. So when we think about the service categories that duals are using on the Medicaid side, and we're not just talking about some, some acute care services more, that are more primarily the Medicare responsibility, but we're talking about behavioral health services. We're talking about long-term services and supports, home and community-based services. So the types of services where Medicare's footprint is uh, relatively minimal and Medicaid is really at the forefront. Uh, but it's also an area where in many states, the operational responsibilities may be divided across various entities within state government. Not everything is going to be housed in the state Medicaid agency directly, although Medicaid may be the, the primary payer for these services. Uh, there, depending on state structures, there may be response, operational responsibility resting in the state's behavioral health agency and the state's um, aging agency or the substance use disorder and treatment agency, for example. And Further, state delivery systems can be configured in a variety of different ways within these different agencies and different arms of state government or even county level government. We have touched on the use of Medicaid managed care um, and managed care can be bifurcated by benefit category. So what plan may be responsible for acute care services but not necessarily responsible for behavioral health or long-term care, or that plan may subcontract those services out. And, or there may be some carve outs where the state at, is directly administering aspects of benefits through their Medicaid fee-for-service programs. And all these configurations look very different across the states. There are states that have really prioritized integration and managed care and have nearly all of their benefits in managed care. And there are states that uh, are on the other end of the spectrum, primarily fee-for-service, and likely will be for the foreseeable future. So further, we know from states that have already gone down the integration path that a commitment to the integration work from the Medicaid director at the most senior level and at the Medicaid director's kind of executive team is a really necessary component of uh, successful integration. But from the most recent data that NAMD has on average Medicaid director tenure, uh, which admittedly is about a year old, so things might have changed a little bit, but our most recent data point is that the average tenure for a Medicaid director is only 21 months, so not even two years. So when you're having that level of turnover at the, at the highest level of the, of the agency, it can be difficult to have that sustained executive leadership commitment to integration, and it can be possible for integration to unfortunately become one of, a back burner issue, for lack of a better term. Uh, as new Medicaid directors come into play, as state, as state administrations change um, through election cycles, et cetera, uh, there will be different priorities and folks will have a different, will be tasked 
when they take that position with advancing different priorities. And so one of the key challenges that I see for uh, widespread integration on the timeline that the report contemplates, which is eight to 10 years, uh, is building a strategic framework that can carry over across transitions of top executive leadership and that has widespread buy-in at the state level such that regardless of how party affiliations change in state executive leadership, there is still that commitment, that engagement, and that buy-in to integration. Um, and, go ahead, Jack. I'm sorry. Sure. I, I just wanted to note that uh, there are many states that probably don't even have that type of strategic framework in place today. And so it's going to take some time just to build it and to, to, to build that engagement. So when we so when the report talks about an eight to 10 year timeline, I do believe that states are going to need every bit of that. And that's for even setting aside uh, the budget challenges imposed by COVID-19 and the oncoming recession. Actually, Jack, I, I do want to come back to that in a moment. Um, and that is, looking at, well, really two issues. One is the heterogeneity of the population. I think people lose track of the fact that they're not all aging into Medicare and low income, therefore duly eligible. But the unique challenges this population present because of the difference in demands in terms of the services that they need. Uh, I think people lose track of that. They think of it in the context of Medicare and the elderly, not in terms of those under 65 uh, who come as a result of disability status. Um, I also want to come back to the question of what is it that the states need? I mean, one of the things we talk about in the report is the assistance that the states need in preparing. As you note, some are essentially at the far end of essentially fee-for-service and still doing a fee-for-service model. Others are uh, moving towards a more managed care environment where they are more coordinated. Uh, so when we when we come back around, I do want to talk about what is it that would be most help to the states. And I know Tim will have a thought of this as well in terms of what have they seen with the demonstrations in terms of, you know, whether it's the architecture, whether it's data systems uh, that essentially allow them to move. I was particularly interested in your point about the short term for most Medicaid directors. Um, and how that challenges the ability to set in place a strategic plan that carries over from um, essentially, you know, director to director and during, you know, turnovers that occur because of uh, elections and how that can change things dramatically. So let's do come back to what is it high on the priority of the states in terms of the list of things that they need. Uh, finally, let me turn to Lois for some initial comments. Um, and, and again, Lois, um, you have a particular perspective having had experience in Massachusetts and in other knowledge, um, you know, what the art of the possible is, uh, and particularly whether all MA plans, I mean, we've talked about the heterogeneity of the population, we've talked about the difference in state Medicaid plans, um, but what about MA plans? I mean, are they all equally able and to participate and um, are they in a position to integrate uh, fully? Uh, and sort of what's the difference in terms of high performance. But Lois, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Sheila, and good morning to everyone. I appreciate your having me here today to talk and to comment on a topic very near and dear to my heart, characterizes my DNA, um, and a policy that I think is critically important to so many across the country. I wanna thank uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center for Leadership, Catherine and her team in particular, in establishing this framework and sustaining this commitment to really looking at and delving deeply into the issues that have served as barriers to integration and to put forth recommendations that are transformative. And frankly, I, I'd also like to thank Tim for his leadership um, the MMCO has done extraordinary work um, throughout the past number of years to really further the ability for dual eligibles to have far better coordinated care. And as Gail pointed out earlier, integration is not a new topic. We've been at this for some time. Um, the earliest demonstration of the successes of the PACE program beginning with Unlock and the early dual eligible demonstrations that really took from those 
experiences with PACE the opportunity to expand to a broader population than PACE is able to serve. So we've been at this a long time and has been cited twice this morning already, and yet less than 10% of duals have the ability, have been uh, benefiting uh, from fully integrated care. So for BPC to put pedal to the metal, if you will, is quite apropos. Um, if we're to ensure that our country's most vulnerable receive the kind of coordinated care that we are capable of and that they're deserving of. One only has to look at the current crisis in our country with COVID-19 impacting all of us to be reminded of the criticality of well-coordinated healthcare that covers all of the domains of our needs, our physical health, behavioral health, functional supports, and responses to social determinants of our health, like food and housing security and safety. An even greater depth of appreciation um, has been instilled within me for the experience of the dual, dual eligibles that most of us are serving. Um, in addition to all of the fears and difficulties that we've been challenged by in living through COVID-19, it's unconscionable to imagine um, the kinds of disparities that both Gail and Tim have spoken of um, that relate to people who are dual eligible, but also the fears that are associated with inadequate food supply or basic access to medications or eviction or increased risk because of living in a congregate living situation and the like. The work that integrated plans do and can do because of their very structure and the flexibilities that are afforded, that are inherent in that structure, really shines a bright light on the art of the possible as Sheila has termed it, for these populations. And during these difficult times, I've been learning about the incredibly responsive and effective and creative interventions that both FIDA SNPs and MMPs across the country um, have been putting forth that have been so validating of what's possible when a health plan possesses all the opportunity and the risk. Policy and program and not reimbursement really driving what's possible for people. And even still, we have such a long way to go. This report by BPC provides us with a pathway towards scaling integration of the foundational piece parts, Medicare and Medicaid financing services and administration of benefits but we have a long road to hope. These are indeed the foundational pieces, but as those plans and other organizations who've been at this for some time know well, there's so much more that needs to be done. The opportunities for innovation are really boundless and we need to be committed to continuously upping our game. Take for example, what we've learned just from this COVID crisis People in congregate living settings, and I'm not just talking about nursing homes, but also assisted living and independent housing for the elderly and persons with disabilities can be made so much safer. There are excellent examples across the country of well-designed housing-based service coordination and supports, but heretofore inadequately connected in a systematic way with others responsible for the health care of their residents, health plans, primary care practices, ACOs, and the like. These housing programs have demonstrated clear ability and opportunity to reduce emergency room hospital in hospitalizations and exacerbations of chronic illness, let alone to provide frontline response in a pandemic. But they're not formally connected they're not formally integrated as part of the work that's done in health plans overall. The same can be said for family caregivers who provide the backbone of long-term services and supports to their loved ones each and every day. 
They're the unsung army of heroes, 53 million of them across the country. They too are first responders to the day-to-day -day needs of their loved ones with unique observations and insights that when harnessed appropriately by the healthcare system can help to mitigate all manner of adverse events, but we don't integrate them effectively in our interdisciplinary teams. We don't adequately empower and support them in, care, in the care that they provide. And they provide not only personal care and things like shopping and housekeeping, but actual skilled care, dressing changes, and observation of swollen ankles for people with congestive heart failure, moms. We need to recognize the unique role that family caregivers play and perhaps we'll do so increasingly so into the future. We need to embrace and equip them with the information and ongoing support that they need to perform their responsibilities and connect the actionable data that they can provide to the healthcare professionals responsible for their loved ones. We need to invest formally in the integration of this forgotten workforce with our healthcare system, beginning with health plans responsible for integrating Medicare and Medicaid service. Those are just two of the many meaningful and great opportunities for continued innovation as we look into the future. But first we need to get these foundation blocks built. And that's what BPC's recommended policy framework accomplishes. And it's really so exciting. As Tim pointed out, you know, engaging dual eligibles is in and of itself um, work that health plans have really needed to learn how to do effectively. Relationships need to be formed and they need to be based on trust, which needs to be earned. And in the two examples I've given, those that people live with, whether it's housing staff or their own family members providing care are not only the most proximate people, but they're trusted and certainly um, you know, able to be integrated effectively with healthcare professionals. Thank you so much, Lois. You've given us uh, an enormous amount to think about and reflecting on uh, as well what your colleagues have pointed out in terms of the challenges. I wonder if we can pause for just a second and look specifically at your, your experience in Massachusetts. Um, and essentially, you know, you were head of a, a dual eligible special needs plan. Um, and, you know, I, I think about it, I was uh, still on the finance committee staff when we first took a look at Onlock uh, that 20 odd years ago and essentially transitioned that to a, a demonstration to PACE that went on for a very long period of time. But tell me your experience in Massachusetts. And then I'm interested in understanding what has really limited the engagement or the enrollment. You know, PACE just never scaled, um, at least as much as we had hoped that it would. Uh, and on, on lock was a unique set of circumstances in Chinatown in San Francisco. Uh, but what, what has your, been your experience in Massachusetts and what do you think has held back the scaling of those kinds of experiences? Well, to begin with, Massachusetts took a very unique approach to integration. Um, to the best of my understanding, they've done something that hasn't been done the same way in other states. They began with seniors who are dual eligible, and it was a number of years before, with, uh, before they extended integrated care to persons with disabilities below the age of 65. And it's important also, I think, to note, so Massachusetts was an early adopter through a dual demonstration back in um, the early 2000s for seniors, uh, an earlier adopter of, of integration. But up until that point, seniors weren't engaged in managed care in Massachusetts. They weren't a part of Medicaid managed care. Um, persons with disabilities were only minimally engaged in managed care through the years. And so Massachusetts really went at this um, in, a, in a, um, a very different kind of way. They really 
approached development of a program that was the whole enchilada. It was with no carve outs for seniors. Um, it was physical health, behavioral health, long-term services and supports. And again, managed care being very, very new to the population. So I think that earning the trust that managed care um, could be a good thing was an initial barrier that needed to be overcome. Um, but I think that it was a very well thought through senior product that was clinically and programmatically based, had key elements in it like an interdisciplinary care team, the requirement of individualized plans of care, the participation of people who were known to the elder population and trusted, which were social workers working in area agencies on aging. I think all of those kinds of elements were very important and enabled what was and continues today to be a voluntary program to be successful in as much as the enrollment was not and still is not as robust as we would aspire for it to be, the voluntary disenrollment in the program was quite and continues to be quite minimal. So I would say that some of the barriers have been the enrollment process, um, the opportunity for all who are eligible to really know of the availability of the program, um, marketing is left to the plans, but there hasn't been a very broad based um, public policy approach to marketing the program. Um, and then we, of course, went into the federal alignment demonstration years later for persons with disabilities, where we did take a different approach, which was passive enrollment with the opportunity for consumers to opt out. And I think we've learned a great deal from that approach as well. So let's pause on that for a moment, because that's an actually a question that we've talked about, and that is the enrollment process uh, and the challenges it presents. Um, and I'm interested in uh, Jean's reaction to this, but also Tim's, um, and that is the question of auto enrollment uh, with the ability to disenroll. Uh, and Jack, I'm sure you have a point of view on this as well. Um, is that part of the solution to the scaling up, which is to let people opt out, but essentially to get them in and let them be exposed to the systems? I'm interested in, in really all of your comments about that as a method. Tim, do you want to begin? Sure, and just to define it, uh, in the program that Lois was referring to, we use past enrollment, which means we notify an individual that they have been assigned to enroll into a particular product, and they get multiple notices, and they get at least 60 days in which to decide that they can opt out of that assignment or stick with it. Um, and even after they stick with it, they have the opportunity to disenroll from that particular health plan or that program. Um, Passive enrollment has led to um, a major increase in integrated care. As I mentioned earlier, of the, about a million people in integrated care products, about half of them are in these demonstrations, and the majority of those uh, through the vehicle of passive enrollment. Um, passive enrollment has its uh, downsides, right? It doesn't feel as friendly as um, educating somebody assertively and helping them make an assertive choice. Um, it uh, runs the risk that people simply didn't understand or didn't, didn't receive even the notifications that were sent to them. Um, and therefore, their status kind of changes and their access to different types of providers changes accordingly. On the flip side, though, as I mentioned, it, it drove the marketplace in an important way. There's a, there's a push-pull dynamic, which say, where are the great innovative health plans that serve this population? And the answer is, they're waiting for people to be enrolled, like, like, like it's a chicken and egg challenge. And so passing on the kind of dr drove some of the market to make meaningful investments in serving this population. But there's another person level impact too, which is we constantly hear of anecdotes in which someone was passively enrolled into a product the health plan in which they were enrolled has a, a requirement from us and from the state that they identify that individual, reach out to them and develop a care plan and do an assessment. And time and time again, 
that process of finding someone exposes someone who had been completely poorly served or not served at all by their existing fee-for-service arrangement. And so the frequency with which you identify unmet social determinants of health, unmet behavioral health treatment, very common. And so passing around the head this, I don't want to call it an unintended consequence, but it has resulted in kind of pushing out the identification of unmet needs in an important way that doesn't exist in the absence of that mechanism. Gene, your thoughts? Uh, uh, in your experience in talking with folks about essentially being enrolled? Well, uh, Sheila, I think uh, Tim did a very good job of capturing some of the pros and uh, some of the benefits and some of the unintended consequences of passive enrollment. I think one of the things that's key uh, as part of this conversation, uh, especially in terms of where we, do, where we go from here, is the element of trust. Uh, and the, uh, the element of being able to be informed, uh, particularly of choices uh, throughout uh, the entire process uh, to ensure that uh, consumers are fully informed about exactly what does this mean for me? Uh, what are the trade-offs? Uh, and, and I think that what we've heard and what we've seen in the past, and again, there's always opportunities to uh, improve on that front, uh, is that to the extent to which that we can do a better job of communicating uh, why is there a change? What is the benefit for the consumer in that change? How are they empowered in that process? And of course, clearly uh, within any form of a passive enrollment arrangement, ensuring that the consumer has adequate uh, safeguards and protections uh, and rights uh, and that they understand that uh, uh, those rights are critically important. And then of course, who should they call in the event that they run into some challenges uh, along the way? So I do think that as we think about uh, moving towards more integrated models, ensuring that we have those elements in place is gonna be really important uh, for consumers and then also for the range of other stakeholders involved. So Jack, is, I'm sorry. Can, can I, Gene is right, as it almost always is. Um, I wanna remind us though that like the concept of Pass enrollment is not totally foreign to Medicare as we have known it for a long time. When you turn 65, we functionally passively enroll you into a fee for service system that has its own, you know, shortcomings. The fact that 20% of hospitalizations resulted in readmission is an indicator that, like, we have not like perfected that default system yet. And so I think the challenge for us is building the evidence base to say which of these particular approaches is going to work best for a particular individual and then setting the default to that particular setting. And the more we can learn about the, the, the impacts of integrated care approaches helps build that evidence base so that you know, building on like behavioral economics approaches, building on the way most of us were auto assigned into a retirement plan. And we kind of identify these options, you know, the, the, the beneficial defaults, and then wrap protections around it so that people can make other choices should they so desire. So Jack, you're likely to be at the other end of the phone uh, or all of your state Medicaid directors are. Um, I mean, your, I mean, how are the Medicaid directors responding to this? I mean, um, you know, it's an interesting question. The heterogeneity of the population make it interesting because how the elderly might respond as compared to those under 65 who are disabled in terms of what their options are. And it brings up as well the question of the networks and what the expectation is at the plans. But Jack, your thoughts and that of the Medicaid directors in terms of enrollment and the enrollment process, and then, and then let's do, to pivot for a moment to talk about networks, uh, but also who are offering these plans? Um, you know, in, whether it's the PACE demonstration and the slow response in terms of the number of plans willing to participate, has the ownership uh, sort of, um, uh, of, the, of the programs made a difference? Uh, the integration or the, the increase in the number of for-profit plans coming in, has that made a difference in terms of willingness to sort of engage? But Jack, let me turn to you first on the aroma question. Len, let's talk about networks and let's talk about who the plans are and how that has changed over time. Sure. So on the enrollment side, I think that you know a passive enrollment to encourage more of a default op 
option or uptake of integrated care is an effective mechanism for promoting more sustained enrollment in integrated care. But I think what we've also seen and some of the evidence that we've seen from certain states participating in the demonstrations, the financial alignment initiatives, is that uh, for completely understandable reasons for, to ensuring consumer choice and informed choice on the Medicare side has has in some states produced challenges for sustainable enrollment in integrated care models and in some cases has led states to reconsider their participation in those models. So there there are definite trade-offs here and it's one and it's somewhat exacerbated by uh, what will likely be an ongoing disconnect between Medicare's uh, ability to opt out uh, at any point in time versus generally a more defined enrollment period on the Medicaid side. Um, like you're probably only going to be having plan changes on an annual basis. Um, and so there's there are potential challenges there for sustaining integration. Um, so I think that it's important to, to make sure that, again, I think I, I do want to build on Tim and Gene's points that the beneficiary completely understands what is on offer here. Because um, I don't want to. I don't want folks to walk away from this conversation thinking that the state view is that the ability to opt out of an integrated care product at any time is a bad thing, because there are individuals where that is probably going to be the appropriate choice for reasons of physicians or healthcare providers that that individual trusts and participates with and has on, has an ongoing relationship with, for whatever reason, may not be in that network, and that's a completely legitimate and appropriate decision to make. But we also want to be cognizant of thinking about taking it up to that system and plan level uh, that we have the ability to promote financially viable um, and sustained enrollment in the in these integrated care products. And this just hasn't always been the case from historical experience. So it leads me to reflect on this question of networks. Um, your point that people may not be satisfied because their chosen provider is not involved. Uh, questions about whether or not the full array of benefits essentially is available. Behavioral health comes to mind as being one that is often contracted out separately and uh, not necessarily fully integrated. Um, what do we know about network issues um, in terms, and Tim, I reflect on on your experience in terms of the demonstrations, but also, uh, no, you know, Lois, in terms of um, what you've experienced, are networks, the establishment of a full network, uh, one of the challenges in terms of getting engagement in these managed care plans? So coming from a plan um, that needed to develop a network for seniors and then years later, a network for persons with disabilities, it is critically important for a plan to have within its network all of the specialized providers that the individuals to be served um, are accustomed to seeing if a barrier is not to exist. Um, the notion of behavioral health as being anything other than fully integrated um, is a totally foreign concept to me, particularly in that over 70% of persons with disabilities in our MMP program in Massachusetts were individuals with comorbid behavioral health issues and to not have the ability to really um, address the totality of needs that that population um, presented with um, it certainly you know is unfathomable um, and we have a lot of work to do not only to bring about the inclusion of providers that were appropriate to the needs of the population, but also in addressing gaps in the network that were identified as a consequence of the work that we did. Um, you know, the most notable of which was the identification of so many people going into acute inpatient psychiatric settings that really needed inpatient care, but not for acute episodes, but rather for respite. Um, and for intervention. And we just did not have sufficient capacity in Massachusetts to address that. And we had to uh, both, both work with our uh, payers to, to our payer to recognize that, but also took it upon ourselves to innovate and create some of that capacity. 
um, ourselves. Um, we have we have to rec we have to recognize a couple of realities for this population. One is that many uh, older adults or people with disabilities and chronic illnesses have numerous specialists. They see numerous different providers. To move from the complex web of um, uh, kind of a network structure that someone has built kind of on their own or in a fee-for-service context into a limited network circumstance is, is understandably, um, you know, scary for, for people whose lives independence depends on literally daily access to certain types of providers. And I think that's, that is really important for all of us to remember as we walk down this road, but also important to remember on, the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act right. is that still today, people with disabilities report um, more challenges finding providers that will see them, even in the Medicare program where coverage really shouldn't be the, the primary issue. And so that is, is all of these dual kind of challenges in connecting people with the right types of services you know, that, that vastly complicate our, just even the concept of what it means to have a network. It, it, it's maybe not the number of cardiologists you have, but it's the variety and accessibility and cultural competence of this almost infinite array of traditional and non-traditional service providers. Uh, Jack, uh, who sets the rules in your view with respect to a network? I mean, is that something that the federal government ought to establish that you ought to have X? Uh, is it something to Tim's point where there's enormous variation geographically by specialty? I mean, there are states where the number of GYNs uh, are limited or behavioral health specialists are limited. How do we navigate that between the feds and the states in terms of establishing what the rules of engagement need to be for these plans if they are in fact to be uh, made available? What are the rules that we ought to be complying with? So I think that generally speaking, the states are probably best positioned to understand the, the intricacies and the nuances of the, of the types of providers that certainly in the Medicaid home and community-based service world that are probably pretty critical components of uh, the, the service network that's supporting dual eligible beneficiaries. So, so having broad federal parameters saying that states need to have network adequacy standards for these type provider types, but not being prescriptive at the federal level about what that standard looks like. Similar to the approach that CMS has taken in the Medicaid world and the Medicaid managed care regulatory framework where network adequacy standards, I believe the current regulations do require some time and distance for certain provider types, but others it's more left to the state to determine. And I think that's the appropriate solution because frankly, a lot of these providers, very small, generally invisible to federal oversight mechanisms anyway. And I think that we've seen some of that playing out in the COVID-19 context with the Provider Relief Fund. It's been very challenging for the federal government to be able to consistently identify those providers. And I think that's going to remain the case. Um, it's the states that generally have the more direct relationships with them. And it's the state, and or as managed care plans contracted by the state that had those more direct relationships. So from my view, uh, it's probably something that that the states are best equipped to execute on. Well, it's an interesting question, particularly with the advent or the dramatic increase in the use of telehealth uh, and <clears throat> query whether or not time and distance will be as compelling a factor going forward because of the availability of being able to do things online that, uh, you know, whether uh, we know those are going to be continued for the near term through 21, I guess, uh, in terms of the waiver under the Medicare program, but real questions about whether we need to rethink essentially what availability means uh, and the uh, resources. Uh, and I'm struck by your comment about cultural sensitivity uh, and the ability of people of color to essentially access uh, providers of color or of similar backgrounds in terms of language and issues. And presumably telehealth will help us uh, to the extent that we can identify. So, but a very important point. I'm going to, um, I have now uh, begun to get some questions from our audience in the time we have left. Uh, the first uh, was, uh, how, will we, how will proposed models such as the direct-to-provider contracts impact networks for integrated products and potentially disrupt integration? 
Anyone want to take that off? Sure. Um, I believe the reference is to a, a new innovation model out of CMS that we refer to as direct contracting. And to, to oversimplify, um, it involves something akin to capitation payment, but mm -hmm. in a fee-for-service context to an organization with which you don't actively enroll, per se, to which you're attributed, um, and in which you, you maintain freedom of choice. I think the promise of the model is toward greater levels of benefit flexibility, approaching a little bit that um, is available in a capitated managed care setting as we know it. Um, I think one of the interesting uh, dynamics that we'll learn from is the extent to which it changes contracting practices in current Medicare Advantage and, and related programs. A lot of the direct contracting approach is replicating things that have been incubated underneath the hood of the Medicare Advantage program, especially like what we have traditionally thought of as subcapitation to primary care practices. And so I think the concepts of evolving risk and flexibility closer to the delivery of service, the beneficiary level is one that has been growing over time. And this allows us to test how it might work in a, in a slightly different context. And, and we're kind of excited to, to learn from that as we go. Okay. Um, another question, how can plans, and this goes back to a, a question I raised at the outset, how can plans and state authorities better articulate the benefits of care coordination to consumers? Goes back to your early comments, Gene, uh, to uh, Lois in terms of the trust element, Jack in terms of what the state Medicaid programs are es essentially expected to do. So how do we do a better job of communicating that information to the consumer? Gene, I'll start with you. I think that's a great question. And I think that uh, I thoroughly enjoyed these conversations uh, with uh, the rest of the panelists because of the fact that it just demonstrates how difficult uh, and challenging uh, it is to really transform systems and do so in a, a quick um, or as quickly as one can. Uh, there's a couple of things I, I, I want to kind of go back to, and Tim kind of pointed to this uh, in one of his earlier uh, points about uh, engaging consumers uh, as part of the outreach effort uh, requires uh, building that trust uh, and really being in it for uh, quite some time. And I know that we've seen uh, some states and some demos really ensure that uh, consumers are part of the design, implementation, and execution process. Uh, whether that is the councils that are being created or the advisory boards that are being supported. And I think it's critically important. Those who are closest to the problem are also uh, critical in helping us try to co-create solutions in order to address those. Uh, and to the extent to which we can uh, bring in consumers uh, into the process of evaluating some of the communication aspects or asking what else could we potentially do or uh, really thinking about ways in which we can try to quote unquote simplify what is frankly a very complicated and complex ex experience and system, I think the better off we'll be. Uh, I did want to mention and wanted to give a lot of kudos to um, one of the recommendations that's in the report and that is around our state health uh, insurance assistance programs and the need to ensure that they have adequate funding and support uh, in order to really help provide that one-on-one -on -one, uh, health insurance counseling and also to support families who are doing it. Uh, Lois said it earlier that uh, family caregivers are really uh, the backbone of our systems and oftentimes don't necessarily get the recognition that uh, they uh, deserve. Uh, we released a report last year that found that family caregivers were doing uh, very complicated medical nursing tasks like giving injections, like giving wound care, really helping to try to navigate these systems uh, and frankly didn't have the information or the training or the support that they needed in order to do so. Uh, and they are also the ones who are also getting this information, having to try to uh, help their family member make these decisions. Uh, so I do think that the more that we can involve the consumers into that process, uh, the better we will be. Mm -hmm. Lois, you wanted to comment? Sure. Well, Jean, thank you. I, you know, the the point about both consumers and family members as appropriate, I think, is such a critical point. Um, as the daughter um, of both my parents at the end of their lives, 
and a professional who knows the system, I, I have witnessed upfront and close the complexity of trying to navigate it and really identify at the right time the appropriate resources that need to be brought to bear. So, um, you know, I think we all have our own stories to tell about that. The one other point that I would make is highly functioning dual eligible special needs plans employ staff that are reflective um, of the communities that they serve. And the staff's ability to engage individual dual eligible participants and community groups is really enhanced through that affinity and understanding of cultural context and the circumstances of their members. So I think, you know, the question about what could plans do, not that um, most plans don't strive to, in fact, think about how to, um, you know, in fact, uh, you know, connect with the communities that they attempt to serve. But I think um, really getting to the grassroots of outreach um, in communities with staff reflective of those communities is a really important statement, both about the plan and about the willingness and the capabilities to serve. Uh, the last question in our short time we have available um, was how should the strategies with respect to integration and exposing consumers vary depending on the population? I mean, should it be different? Again, we've talked about the extraordinary heterogeneity of the population. Should the strategies differ uh, and how best to essentially engage different populations and families? Uh, in terms of making them aware of the benefits of integration and helping them essentially engage in that population. So last question, a quick round of quick response, Jack. I would say that it probably will have to. I think we can see some commonalities in terms of principles for engagement. And I think that both Gene and Lois have done an excellent job of articulating some of the, the things that are effective. And I know that some states have, through membership advisory councils that are composed of direct recipients of Medicaid services that, that are representative of the types of individuals that receive them are a useful mechanism here. But I think having listening to those communities and having those that input shape the variable engagement strategies that reflect the, differ, the differing needs of the dual populations that are in a state are going to be an obvious component. I think that grounding it in that engagement, but varying the engagement by, based on the input provided is probably the most viable path forward. Okay. Lightning round, Gene, one minute on that. Oh, Gene, you're muted. I would agree. I would agree with Dra uh, with Jack. I think if we're taking a consumer centric approach to this, uh, that they're uh, that uh, really kind of thinking about the end user and what their needs are and how to actually reach out to them is going to be critically important, while at the same time having some uh, broad framework to ensure that there is some consistency uh, throughout the system is going to be important. OK, Lois, one minute. The only thing I would add to my esteemed colleagues comments is for us not to forget the heterogeneity of the population to be served and what, what will work um, in serving elders and uh, the dependence in, in many cases on uh, outreach you know, to those around them, family caregivers as an example, may be less desirable or appropriate or possible um, as it pertains to you know, people who are younger with living with disability associated with uh, severe physical disability, as an example. So I think we've got to have stratified approaches to the various subpopulations that we're trying to serve. Tim, you get the last minute. It was well said. Thanks for the chance to be here, Sheila. All right. I want to thank uh, the entire panel for their remarkable contributions throughout the length of this process uh, and through our preparing the report, responding to our recommendations. Uh, and their availability to us when we had questions. Um, our primary goal is, as we stated, to improve the beneficiary experience and the outcomes that they are confronting. Uh, and over time, we think there are, in fact, potentials for serving um, these populations. There are savings potentially available as a result of reduced hospitalizations, readmissions, ER visits, uh, and essentially the utilization of long-term care services 
uh, but essentially uh, this is another step in a very long process that's gone on for a long time that began with unlock but is moving forward so my thanks to everyone my thanks to the bipartisan policy center as well for another really terrific discussion uh, be well and stay safe all thank you very much